Welcome. Happy Labor Day weekend. I'm so glad you joined us today. This is a traditional, unofficial end of summer and the beginning of fall, which means that a lot of the things that we put on pause for the summer are going to be starting up again. And that includes our Bible studies on Zoom on Wednesdays. I hope that you'll make that part of your fall plans. It's also the first Sunday of the month, and we will be sharing communion together, so have your bread or cracker and your juice or water handy. Now, let us pray. Surprising and persistent God, you never give up on us. You seek us, follow us, call us. We cannot escape from your yearning for us, and only when we turn to you do we find the sweetness of life, the reason for living an ever-flowing fountain of joy. Thank you for your amazing grace that surprises us, comforts us, and renews us. Give us hearts of gratitude, and forever let us sing your praise. Amen. Now let's join together in song. One bread and one body.
Now, as we prepare to hear God's word proclaimed, let us begin with prayer. Loving God, still our minds and quiet our worries. Open our ears and our hearts so that we might hear with joy what you would say to us this day. Amen. You know, for a long time, I didn't know much about the book of Esther. Esther was just a name to me, happened to be the first name of my favorite aunt, but it was quite frankly old-fashioned and rather uncommon. Disciple Bible study is the first time that I really studied this book. Did you know that it's one of the most controversial books of the Bible? Now, the story of a young Jewish woman who becomes the wife of the king of Persia and uses her position to save her people is a great story. But nowhere in this book is God ever mentioned. Now, a lot of people have a problem with including a book in the Bible that never mentions God. Even though it is clear when you read it that God is present in the actions of the story. But today's sermon isn't about Esther. It's the story of Vashti, who is the queen before Esther, the one whom Esther replaced. Let's hear her story from Esther, chapter 1, verses 1 through 21. This happened in the days of King Ahasuerus, the same Ahasuerus who ruled over 127 provinces from India to Ethiopia. In those days, when King Ahasuerus sat on his royal throne in the citadel of Susa, in the third year of his reign, he gave a banquet for all his officials and ministers. The army of Persia and Media and the nobles and governors of the provinces were present, while he displayed the great wealth of his kingdom and the splendor and pomp of his majesty for many days, 180 days in all. When these days were completed, the king gave for all the people present in the citadel of Susa, both great and small, a banquet lasting for seven days in the court of the garden of the king's palace. There were white cotton curtains and blue hangings tied with cords of fine linen and purple to silver rings and marble pillars. There were couches of gold and silver on a mosaic pavement of porphyry, marble, mother of pearl, and colored stones. Drinks were served in golden goblets, goblets of different kinds, and the royal wine was lavished in accordance with the bounty of the king. Drinking was by flagons without restraint, for the king had given orders to all the officials of his palace to do as each one desired. Furthermore, Queen Vashti gave a banquet for the women in the palace of King Ahasuerus. On the seventh day, when the king was merry with wine, he commanded Mahuman, Biztha, Harbona, Bigtha, and Abaktha, Zethar, and Carcass, the seven eunuchs who attended him, to bring Queen, queen Vashti before the king, wearing the royal crown, in order to show the peoples and the officials her beauty, for she was fair to behold. But Queen Vashti refused to come at the king's command conveyed by the eunuchs. At this, the king was enraged and his anger burned within him. Then the king consulted the sages who knew the laws, for this was the king's procedure toward all who were versed in law and custom. And those next to him were Karshina, Shethar, Ad Admatha, Tarshish, Miris, Marcina, and Memokan the seven officials of Persia and Media, who had access to the king and sat first in the kingdom. According to the law, what is to be done to Queen Vashti because she has not performed the, king of the command of King Ahasuerus conveyed by the eunuchs? Then Memekin said in the presence of the king and the officials, Not only has Queen Vashti done wrong to the king, but also to the officials and all the peoples who are in all the provinces of King Ahasuerus. For this deed of the queen will be made known to all women, causing them to look with contempt on their husbands, since they will say, King Ahasuerus commanded Queen Vashti to be brought before him, and she did not come. This very day the noble ladies of Persia and Media, who have heard of the queen's behavior, will rebel against the king's officials, and there will be no end of contempt and wrath. If it pleases the king, let a royal order go out from him and let it be written among the laws of the Persians and the Medes so that it may not be altered that Vashti is never again to come before King Ahasuerus and let the king give her royal position to another who is better than she. 
So when the king decree is made by the king, when, so when the decree made by the king is proclaimed throughout all his kingdom, vast as it is, all women will give honor to their husbands, high and low alike. This advice pleased the king and the officials, and the king did as Memucan proposed. My first real encounter came with, uh, with Vashti came in seminary. One of my preaching classes uh, had a textbook that included a sermon by a woman about Vashti. It's the inspiration for this sermon today because it made such a great impression on me. I came to appreciate there are two women's stories in the book of Esther, even if Vashti's is short and cryptic. Vashti's story is the story of just say no. The first chapter sets the stage for the rest of the book and introduces some important themes. It begins much like Luke begins his gospel by grounding the story firmly in history. This is the time of Persian domination, putting it late in the Old Testament history. The king is Ahasuerus, though most think his name was better known as Xerxes or Ataxerxes. There are also signs that this is more than just a historical tale. For instance, this great banquet is described in the first part of the passage. Did you notice how long it lasted? 180 days. Now, I know that our government seems paralyzed these days, but what if, imagine if we took off six months for a drunken banquet. Likewise, there's a lot of description of the opulence and wealth on display. The furnishings and ornaments are described in great detail. We, the readers, understand that the king is not just rich, but flashy, over the top, even obnoxious in his flaunting of his wealth. And that desire to display his possessions is what gets Vashti in trouble. See, while the men are having their great feast, Vashti is hosting the women in her quarters. After the king has gotten good and drunk, and the writer says he's merry with wine, he realizes there is one possession missing, his wife. He sends seven eunuchs to fetch her adorned with her crown. People have wondered for many years why this summon is so objectionable to Vashti. One thought has been that the king wanted her to come out in nothing but the crown party of drunks. Vashti does something remarkable and either very brave or very foolish, depending upon your point of view. She says no. She refuses to obey. The writer gives no reason, just that she says no. It's telling that at a Bible study on this passage, there wasn't much hesitation understanding why she said no. Who wouldn't refuse to go and be put on display like a prized cow in front of a bunch of drunks? Well, this leaves the king speechless. I can see him sputtering. She, she said, she said, what? He literally doesn't know what to do. Has anyone ever said no to him? Denied him any whim? So he calls in his advisors for help. And they leap to the most logical conclusion, right? Oh, no. All the other women are going to hear about this and start saying no to their husbands. It will be chaos. So they give their advice to the king. Forbid Vashti to come into the royal presence ever. Essentially set her aside. Divorce her. Make her a nobody. And put this out as a royal decree so that everyone will know what happens to people who defy the king. And women will respect and listen to their husbands. The king thinks this is a great idea, and he does it. There are a couple important points about the consequence of this decree. See, it's ironic first that the king actually gives Vashti what she wanted with the decree. He's the one who wanted her to come in. Now he's decreed that she won't have to. My mother called this cutting off your nose to spite your face. And second, he set a precedent that apparently wasn't clear before and which will become important later in the story. Once the king has made a decree, it is an absolute law and no one, not even him, can rescind it. He can't alter it or change it ever. If you think about this, this is a very foolish way to govern. No one can predict all the circumstances that may arise, 
like a strong-willed wife who says no. No reasonable, intelligent leader would hamstring himself by making a law which even he can't take back. I think someone should read the story of Esther to our leaders in Washington. This is the last time we hear of Vashti. We don't know what happened to her. We just know that she said no. And there were consequences to her and to those around her when she did. You know, they, we all have to take stands on things. Taking a stand brings consequences. Vashti faced her consequences. She lost her place at court. She lost her, her position, her prestige, her wealth. Other people have taken stands, said no, and had to face the consequences of their actions. Martin Luther said no to the excesses of the Catholic Church of his day. He was excommunicated and vilified. Dietrich Bonhoeffer said no to Hitler. He was arrested, sent to a concentration camp, and executed. Some people who say no remain anonymous, and we may never know what consequences they faced. I always think of the, the man in Tiananmen Square who stood in front of the tank with his shopping and the bags in his hands. Also, this is the story of women who live with an abusive spouse and what happens when she finally says no. Consequences aren't always negative, though. Uh, Martin Luther started something much bigger than himself with his no. You and I are part of that story. Uh, that Bible study group thought of another modern example, Rosa Parks. She said no, she wouldn't go to the back of the bus, and, and the civil rights movement took off. Those kids who were part of the movement and sat at the Woolworth lunch counter said no, they weren't going to leave until they got served, and they changed history. Being a disciple of Jesus often means standing up and saying no. Being a disciple means going against the prevailing opinion, being countercultural, not conforming to this world, as Paul wrote. Jesus said no. He said no to the temptations offered by Satan in the desert, no to the Pharisees and scribes and priests, the establishment of his day, no to Pilate and Herod. His nose led to the cross. His disciples learned what it meant to say no. When it came time to stand before the Sanhedrin and were told to stop preaching in Jesus' name, they said no. And they faced the consequences, imprisonment, beatings, even crucifixion. We all know that saying no isn't always easy. Well, some things are easy to say no to. When I look at the Ten Commandments, I don't have much trouble with the ones about adultery, murder, and stealing. I can say no to those. Other things are a little tougher, though, like putting God first in my life, not envying others, standing up for the widow and orphan, the people without a voice. You know, Just Say No was a popular anti-drug program in the 1980s. And let's admit, it didn't work so well. If it was easy to just say no, we would have won the war on drugs. Saying no is difficult and has consequences. But as followers of Christ, we are called to say no to the things God says no to. And when we don't, we don't say no alone. God stands with us even when the world hates us and there are consequences. But I'd rather face them than the consequences when I don't say no to the things God says no to. Wouldn't you? Amen. As we prepare to take the Lord's Supper together, let us pray. Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him who, and seek to grow into his likeness. Let us draw near with faith, make our humble confession, and prepare to receive this holy sacrament. 
Lord, we do not presume to come to this, your table, trusting in our own goodness, but in your unfailing mercies. We are not worthy that you should receive us, but give your word and we shall be healed through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. Lift up your hearts and give thanks to the Lord our God. Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, you made us in your image to love and be loved. When we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. By the suffering death, and resurrection of your only Son, Jesus Christ. You delivered us from slavery to sin and death and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which Jesus gave himself up for us, he took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples, and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so, in remembrance of your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. And now with the confidence of children of God, let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Because we are many, the, body, the bread which we share is the body of Christ. In him we are one. The cup we give thanks over is the cup of our salvation. You'll take your bread, the body of Christ broken for you. This is the blood of Christ shed for you. Let us pray. Most bountiful God, we give you thanks for the world you have created, for the gift of life, and for giving yourself to us in Jesus Christ, whose holy life, suffering and death, and glorious resurrection have delivered us from slavery to sin and death. We thank you that in the power of your Holy Spirit, you have fed us in this sacrament, united us with Christ, and given us a foretaste of your heavenly banquet. We are your children, and yours is the glory, now and forever, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And now where will we go and who will we be? We go out into the world to be God's people. And the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit are standing with us, helping us, strengthening us. Amen.